Hello everyone and welcome back to Virtual Thermal Dynamics. So we've been talking about Rankine cycles which are heat engines and heat engines take input heat and turn it into usable power, usually mechanical power. So another really important system that burns things to make things move is the internal combustion engine. So today and next class we're going to talk about internal combustion engines and we're going to do examples with an auto cycle and a diesel cycle. It turns out that internal combustion engine analysis is actually very complicated. Uh, the cycles are not adiabatic. They're combustion of air so the working fluid actually changes during the cycle because chemical reactions are happening. Uh, there's kinetic energy which could be important because your piston is moving up and down. This can be a transient process because things like temperature and pressure are changing with time. And inside your piston, uh, sometimes your system is open when certain valves are open, and sometimes it's closed when both of those intake and outlet valves are closed. So it's, in real life, a very complicated system. And to get sort of a very good idea of what's going on, you probably want to do some numerical or computer simulation. But if you'd like to do an analytical or hand calculation type analysis to figure out what's going on, we can do that if we make a series of assumptions. So things that we're going to do in this type of analysis, first we're going to neglect combustion. So we're going to assume that heat gets transferred into our system and out of our system, but we're going to neglect the fact that there's any kind of chemical changes that happen. We're going to assume that our system is always closed, so we'll use the closed versions of the first and second law, which means that we'll be using specific internal energy and not specific enthalpy in most cases. We're going to assume that all the processes are reversible or ideal. We're going to assume that the working fluid is an ideal gas, typically air, and sometimes we'll assume that the specific heat is constant meaning we'll do what's called a cold air standard analysis. Now, each time we make one of these assumptions, we're stepping a little bit further away from reality. And that's okay as long as we remember what we're doing. And what that means is that the results we'll get from this kind of analysis are more qualitative than quantitative. And oftentimes, that's kind of what an engineer has to do. We're tasked with designing or improving systems with imperfect information. And that's what we can do with this kind of analysis. The thing that differentiates auto cycles and diesel cycles is the assumption that we'll make when we're adding heat. Now, we're going to do an auto cycle analysis in this first example, and there we're going to assume that heat is added at constant volume. So, Auto cycle charts look like this. Sometimes we want to look at PV charts and sometimes TS charts. Now, personally, I find for these closed system analysis analyses, PV charts are a little bit more useful. Although looking at the TS charts, we see which processes are isentropic, which is also important. So my compression stroke moves from state one to state two. Here you can imagine a piston moving up so that the volume inside my cylinder is shrinking and the pressure is increasing. Next, we're adding heat. So maybe there's a spark plug and some ignition, right? So we start to burn our fuel, although we're assuming that it's just heat being transferred in. And then we get what we call the power stroke. So in the power stroke, what happens is now the piston is moving downward. So my volume is increasing and my pressure is dropping. And what that does is it's, it's generating power or work in my system. Finally, we have some exhaust of heat to the surrounding area. So we're venting heat. So this is still a heat engine. So when we characterize this system, we're looking at thermal efficiency. Thermal efficiency is net work divided by heat in. And if we did a first law analysis on each of these processes, we would find that 
the work we're generating, the work out of our system, is U3 minus U4, and the work in, in our compression stroke, is U1 minus U2. That's a negative number, whereas work out is positive. That's why we have green and red in our equation. The heat in happens between states 2 and 3, and it's given by U3 minus U1. We can also rearrange this equation to find that the thermal efficiency is 1 minus, in the numerator, U4 minus U2, divided by the denominator, U3 minus U2. So, in each one of the processes, if I do the first law analysis, now for closed systems, I'm going to neglect changes in kinetic energy and potential energy. And then for each process, I'm going to assume that it's either adiabatic, meaning no heat, or passive, meaning no work in or out. If I make all of these assumptions, I can find the following equations from the first law telling me either the power generated or consumed and the heat that's either added or lost from my system. There's two ways, if I think about what's the fluid, in this case it's an ideal gas, and there's two ways that I can use to find these delta U's. So if I assume that it's variable specific heat, or that the temperature is changing enough that the specific heat changes are important, then um, in our textbook we can look in tables like A22 and A23 to find the changes in U or specific U's giving a temperature and pressure. Or if it's constant specific heat or a cold air standard analysis, I know that delta U is equal to CV times delta T. Just going into more depth about what to do, right? So it's important to know what the fluid is in all of these thermodynamic cycles. So in this case, our working fluid is air which we're assuming is an ideal gas, which means that we can use the ideal gas law in its different forms. We can use it at a single state, saying that PV is equal to MRT, right? Or we can use it from state to state, knowing that PV over T is constant, because we're assuming that everything is a closed system, so M and R remain constant for the whole cycle. So if I know T at every state, I should be able to solve my thermodynamic cycle. So in our ideal gas law, if we're using variable specific heat, we're going to look things up on table A22. And the trick to these cycles that use air as a working fluid is to look for the processes that are isentropic, where S does not change. So that's why it is important to know what the TS diagrams for these cycles look like. Because in processes that are isentropic, we know if we're assuming variable specific heat, that the ratio of VR1 to VR2 is equal to the ratio of V1 over V2S, right? So here we're assuming this is only true when the process is isentropic. If we're using a cold air standard with constant specific heat, we know that delta U is equal to CV times delta T. And then we're looking for equations that give us the ratio of the temperatures as a ratio of something with K in the exponent. In this case, because it's a closed system, we're interested in the volume ratios. And we can use this equation for isentropic processes. So we're going to look at an air standard auto cycle in this problem. So the auto cycle has all internally reversible processes when we're solving it analytically. So it's important to know what these TS and PV diagrams look like. One of the things that's nice about an analytical solution like this is even though it's, it's not always going to be perfectly accurate because we're making so many assumptions, we can learn about the real system or how we might be able to improve the real system just by looking at what happens. So here we define the compression ratio as being V1 divided by V2. And when we do that, we see if we draw that on a TS diagram, that if we increase the compression ratio, 
then what happens is my area inside my cycle gets bigger. And that means I'm increasing my net work. So I can see that if I have a larger compression ratio, I can do more work with my engine. Now we'll start our example. So here we have an example for an auto cycle. We're given some properties of air and the beginnings of a state table. We're also told that the compression ratio is equal to 10. We're also told that it's a four cylinder, four stroke engine with a given RPM. So what do we do? If you don't know what you're doing in thermodynamics or you feel a little bit lost, you can almost always start by doing a first law analysis. So we can do the first law analysis on every process in my cycle. And if I do that and I make a series of assumptions, I can get these equations which I've already talked about in this, uh, in this lecture. So now I can find that my net work is going to be the work in my two processes that are either creating or requiring work. Here I've carried my units through my process. But if I want to go from work to power, I need to use my work and then I need to know something about how, how many cycles are happening per minute. So here I have my net work, which in this case is in BTU. I multiply that by the rotational speed of the engine, right? So I have how many rotations per minute. And then I need to know if it's a two-stroke engine or a one-stroke or a, or a four-stroke engine. And in this case, because it's a four-stroke engine, I know that I go through one cycle every two rotations. So when I do this math for my particular problem, I can see that my power is, so when, I can see that I know N, but I don't know W net. And if I knew W net, then I could get my power. So I don't know how much mass is in my system. I don't know delta U between one and two, and I don't know delta U between three and four. That means I don't know W net. So what I want to do is find out the things that I don't know in the previous equation. So the first thing I can try to do is find the mass in my system. So I look for a state where I know the most about the process. So here it looks like state one I know the temperature and the pressure. So if I look at state one and I take the ideal gas law and rearrange it for mass, I can find that M is equal to P1 V1 over R T1. If I put that into my equation, I can find how much mass is in my system. That's good because now I know the mass and I know N. I still don't know delta U, which means either of the delta U's, which means that I don't know W. So in this case, I'm using table A22 in my textbook. Because I know the temperature and the pressure, I can find VR. And when I know VR, then I can use that to find U. I know as I move from state one to state two, I'm doing that at constant specific entropy. So because the process is isentropic, I know that here I have a volume ratio, and now I have a volume ratio, which means that I can, uh, I can find the volume from one to two, and I know that that is equal to the same ratio if I do my VRs. And because of that, I know that I can take VR and divide by 10 and get VR2. And once I know VR2, then I can put that back into table A22 and interpolate to get temperature and specific internal energy. Now that I know specific internal energy and temperature, I can use the ideal gas law to find the pressure. The math for that is given down here. So now I fixed my second state. As I move between state two and state three, I know that I can use the ideal gas law again, but this time I'm using the ideal gas law between states. I know that this 
process is not isentropic, so I can't use the isentropic relationship, but I can use the ideal gas law. So I know that P3V3 over T3 is equal to MR, which is also equal to P2V2 over T2. I'd like to find T3, so I take this equation, and I can isolate for T3 and find an expression. Here, I know everything, so I can put it into my calculator, and I can find that the temperature here is 3,820 degrees Rankin. It's really important in these calculations to remember that these temperatures are not temperature differences. And anytime we have an equation that's not a temperature difference, we always want to use absolute temperatures. So in this case, it's an imperial problem, so we use Rankin, but if it was in metric, we would want to use Kelvin. But now that I know the temperature and the pressure, or even just the temperature, I think, we can go back to A22 and we can interpolate to find the specific internal energy and to find VR. With the temperature and VR, I can use the volume ratio again to find four, to find the volume uh, VR at state four. So here again, because this is an isentropic process, as I move from three to four, S remains constant. So here I knew that this is also 10 VR or V4 over V3 has to be equal to VR4 over VR3, and that's 10. So for an auto cycle, because I add heat at constant volume, there's only two volumes in the problem. So once I know the compression ratio, I know that that ratio works as I go from state one to state two, and as I go from state three to state four. If I know what my PV diagram looks like, then I can remember which volume is bigger, so I can put the bigger volume on top. In this case, four is bigger than three. Knowing VR4, I can interpolate on the table and find T4 and U4. Now that I know all of my specific internal energies, I can find my net work. In this case, 0.45 BTU. Now I can put that information into what I already know and use that equation to find the power. So that's how I do this problem this problem if I'm going to do an air standard analysis, but what do I do if I want a cold air standard analysis or if I want to assume that the specific heat is constant? In this case, all of my equations for delta U become CV times delta T. I'm going to use one CV for this problem based on some temperature that I'm going to pick. Right, again, I know N, but I don't know W net. I do know the mass because I've already calculated it. It won't be any different. I don't know delta U or delta U, right? Or in this case, I don't know the temperature differences from T1 to T2 and from T3 to T4. <coughs> so this is what my state table would look like if I was doing this as a cold air standard problem. So now for cold air standard processes that are isentropic, I want to look for an equation that has K in the exponent. And because this is an auto cycle problem, it's a closed system, and I know the volume ratio, so I'm going to pick this equation. I can rearrange this to find T2. I put what I know into my calculator, and I can put on my state table that I know the temperature at state two. I can use the ideal gas law to go from the temperature to the pressure at state two. Now, when I move from state two to state three, just like I did in the um, variable specific heat problem, I use the ideal gas law. So I know that P3V3 over T3 is equal to P2V2 over T2. And I can use that information to solve for T3. When I go from state three to state four, I remember that this is an isentropic process. Again, I'm going to know the ratio of volumes, so I can use this equation the only thing that I don't know is T4. So I put things into my calculator and I find that T4 is just under 1500 degrees Rankin. Now, my net work equation looks like this. I've replaced my delta U's with CV times delta T. 
I put in the information that I know and I find the network. I put that network information into my calculator and I find what the net power for the engine is. So that's how we do problems either with constant or variable specific heat for auto cycles. Thanks for joining me on Virtual Thermodynamics. I'll see you again next time.